Welcome to Disruption Dialogues Podcast Season 2. Listen to the influential leaders and trailblazers from around the world as they share invaluable insights to navigating the fifth industrial revolution. Hello and welcome to another episode of Disruption Dialogue Season 2. I am Yamini Jain, Vice President Healthcare at Markets and Markets, and I will be having a conversation with Drew Logan. Drew is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Medtronic's gastrointestinal business, where he leads a global team to provide innovative solutions for healthcare organizations. With diverse experience in leadership roles across top companies like Medtronic, Boston Scientific, and Dell EMC, Drew excels in developing strategies and solving complex problems for the betterment of patients worldwide. Thank you for, uh, for joining us today, Drew. Thank you for having me. In today's episode, we embark on an exploration of a realm that continues to transform and captivate individuals around the globe. From revolutionary technologies to empowered patients, the healthcare industry is undergoing a profound shift, placing consumers at the forefront like never before. Join us as we delve into the fascinating intricacies of healthcare consumerism and discover the incredible potential it holds for shaping the future of healthcare. So Drew, how does healthcare consumerism empower individuals to take control of their health and make informed decisions about their medical care? I thought it might actually help uh, for uh, establishing for the listeners maybe uh, what healthcare, healthcare consumerism is uh, first. And it's really a, a very simple concept, um, but it's nuanced because it's healthcare, right? Uh, and it's, it's really how I would define it is it's a movement where individuals take more control of their own healthcare decisions. So um, other similar terms might be uh, patient empowerment, patient engagement. And, and the bottom line is it allows, uh, it allows patients um, to, uh, to be more conscientious of the value that they receive from the choices about healthcare. So value being defined as benefits and outcomes and experience versus the cost that they pay. And they're behaving uh, much more like uh, we do in other industries. So uh, I thought maybe it might be helpful to give an analogy of of when you go to buy a new car, right? Um, you decide what's important to you. Do you want to go fast? What color do you want? How many people do you want to 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 go in your car? Maybe what uh, how many seats you want? Do you want air conditioning? All those all those types of things. And then then you do your research on the types of cars that might fit uh, what you're most interested in. You narrow the the list down of the types of cars, and then you start looking for for dealers. and And how do you pick your dealer? You might base it on previous experience. Uh, you might base it on uh, the salesperson, maybe customer service, or or even referrals from from other folks uh, that you might know. Um, and then you try to get your reasonable uh, price, and maybe in some cases the lowest price. So um, you know. That type of experience and those types of behaviors are now we're seeing in healthcare, and clearly healthcare is much different than than buying a car. But hopefully, you get my point. So, why is it a good thing? Um, it forces our entire industry towards more accessible and easy to understand um, information. Uh, it's forcing industry towards more transparency. Um, it's also forcing industry to develop solutions uh, that drive satisfaction for patients and the and their healthcare experience. So it's it's really creating more competitiveness uh, between the various stakeholders uh, who provide goods and services in our industry, um, and they need to treat patients not just as consumers, but now they're treating them as customers. And when you think about that, it's very profound, right? So organizations retain their customers by coming up with strategies to keep them happy. And they attract uh, other customers from their competitors by doing things better than them, right? So this competitive behavior, I think, is creating change for the good. Um, and I believe, you know, in general, consumerism is good for our industry. It's, um, it's again, uh, creating uh, more value for patients, improving quality, at reducing costs. And when you add in the third element of, of access, you have what we call the triple aim in healthcare. Um, um, best quality, lowest costs, and best access, which I believe, you know, more empowered and engaged patients will, will help drive. 
Great. No, that's I think that, that that's wonderful to hear. And uh, the car analogy worked very well. I, I, I understand it much better now. So really, you know, uh, moving on, what do you think are some of the current challenges or barriers to widespread adoption of healthcare consumerism? I mean, why is it lagging behind the other industries? People are as aware, but we're still lagging. How can these challenges be addressed to ensure that expectations of patients and families are met? Yeah. Well, it really needed several market forces to occur uh, in order to start gaining momentum. And, um, you know, a couple of those market forces were, um, you know, number one, the advent of high deductible health plans. So as, um, you know, uh, employers and the government, you know, shifted more of the cost burden uh, to patients, um, now patients are are more interested in becoming more more active in their own care. You know, previously when you had low deductible plans and there wasn't much change between the providers that you uh, selected based on from a cost perspective, what did patients care about? Well, they cared about you know getting quality care, a good experience, a nice physician, but they really didn't care about cost. So with the shifting of this cost now uh, to patients, there's a lot more focus on on that total value equation. Um, also, employers are making it easier for patients to get information and make decisions based on, on value. Um, I actually switched to a high deductible plan a few years ago, and it took me a few years, honestly, to get used to it. But I can tell you, you know, I'm a relatively healthy person, and so it made sense to me to do that. Uh, but I have access to um, comparative uh, quality data on the providers, all the cost data on the providers. I have it at my fingertips on an app. And it's a really nice experience. Um, in addition to the employer-sponsored plans, uh, we also, of course, have the Affordable Care Act, where everybody has the ability to get information and compare uh, price and their policies on the public marketplace. So really, that shift of cost is, is one huge market dynamic, I think, that, uh, that we had to have happen. Um, the, the second um, focus or second market for uh, uh, change was there's been a historical lack of information and transparency in, in healthcare. Um, you know, 10 years ago, you know, you couldn't find uh, good information on, on the internet about your provider and do really uh, uh, comparative and, and God help you if you could figure out your healthcare bill, right? But today, the good news is there's been regulations that are forcing change. Uh, the hospital price transparency rule went into effect in, in 2021. Uh, there's a new act called the No Surprises Act, which took effect last year, and it's all about the fact that when you um, you know get um, emergent care, that you have to be charged in your in-network rates, not out-of-network rates. People were getting surprised with higher bills uh, when they had um, you know emergency care. So, uh, you know, I think the stakeholders in the industry started to realize that the market was being influenced by the patient experience. Uh, and they needed to invest in, in new strategy, which kind of leads me to the third key, I think, market force that changed. And that was the fact that we had really a lag out in our digital infrastructure, a lag rather in the build out of our digital uh, infrastructure. Um, you know, the investments in, in digital and healthcare has been well behind other industries. And so because patients now are paying more out of pocket, they want the best value for the healthcare decisions. Uh, they expect experiences that are more like their other experiences in their life. So I gave you the car example. Think about e-commerce, uh, the airline industry, the hospitality industry. Um, and, and I'll give you two you know, personal examples, uh, one online scheduling and the other, uh, you know, uh, online bill pay. Um, you know, a few years ago, I had some um, some care and I received a, um, a notice from a collection agency in the mail. That uh, that they that my healthcare bill wasn't paid and they 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 sent and referred me to a healthcare or a collection agency. So I I called the collection agency. They said, yeah, you didn't pay this bill. And I'm like, well, that's crazy. I called the hospital and and it was legit. I just never received the bill, right? Mm -hmm. So we got it resolved, but it took a lot of back and forth. Fast forward that to just a few weeks ago. Uh, again, I had an appointment uh, and um, I got a text on my phone a few weeks later. And it, it was from my provider, and it said your your bill is ready. Would you like to see it? And it was a legit text, so I clicked on it, and up came my bill. I zoomed in on it, and it was legit. Uh, the the copay was legit, and it said pay your bill here. So I clicked on pay your bill, and I could pick PayPal, Apple Pay, or my credit card. 
I clicked on PayPal, the bill was paid, and what a wonderful experience, the same kind of experience we have, you know, in other industries. Um, the other uh, example I'll give you is, is online scheduling. Um, uh, I read as I was researching for this discussion that 60% of patients use online scheduling and 94% of patients would be willing to switch to a provider that practices, that has it, which I think is really profound. Um, now, I, another uh, issue, a small orthopedic issue, I need an MRI. I'm actually getting it later today. And um, I can't online schedule for it. So I had, after I got my referral, I called um, the MRI um, office and you'll never guess what happened. I went to voicemail, right? <laughs> and they called me back. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but uh, it's hard to reach me on my cell phone. You know, I'm either in a meeting, I'm on a Zoom meeting, I'm on an airplane, um, or I don't recognize the number. I don't pick up because I get a lot of spam, right? And so, you know, this went back and forth for literally days for us to try to get this MRI schedule. So why you can't schedule online? Uh, you know, we still have providers that, that don't do that. And I think that's very frustrating for consumers. So I guess I'll kind of summarize your question. And I think the emergence of high deductible health plans, the move towards comparative quality and cost data, and transparency and the rapid build out of our digital infrastructure, they're all helping to accelerate healthcare consumerism and uh, catch up with other industries. Great. So Drew, you actually, um, you know, in your answer talked about you have access to some of the sources and the tools and, you know, you can compare which plan to go for. So that actually um, is quite intriguing because I'd like to understand what resources and tools are available to help patients become effective advocates for themselves or their loved one within the healthcare industry or healthcare system? So what are what do they have access to? Yeah, well, the good news is there's a lot. Uh, and the bad news is there may be too much. <laughs> I, I talk to physicians sometimes and they tell me that they spend a lot of their time uh, basically discussing with patients and, and dispelling all the bad information that they researched on the internet. And so I think there, although there's a lot of information, finding the right resources is so important. So um, again, when I was uh, researching uh, for this discussion, I found uh, a really nice uh, paper by McKinsey on healthcare consumerism, and they framed up the eight steps in a patient's healthcare journey. And so, um, and those eight steps are as follows, uh, you know, getting coverage, um, understanding uh, your benefits, uh, finding care, receiving care, following up with the provider, filling and managing your prescriptions, managing your own health, and then saving and paying for care. And so I thought maybe uh, I'll touch on a few tools that are available for some of these points uh, along the, the patient journey. And when it comes to getting coverage, if you're fortunate enough to get uh, coverage by your employer, um, then you know, they should offer a ton of information. I can tell you my Medtronic, uh, uh, my employer Medtronic offers a really good comparative data. They even have a voice assistant that, uh, that walks me through the process and helps me compare plans and sell in on the best one. Uh, if you're getting government uh, health insurance, then obviously there's information available on uh, public market or Medicare and Medicaid. So um, you know, whoever provides uh, uh, access to that coverage should provide you know information. When it comes to finding care, which is probably one of the most important steps, right? There again, a lot of information. Uh, I would consult information available via your health plan. Um, referrals are huge. You know, lean on your uh, on your friends and family for referrals. Uh, there are reviews, consumer reviews like Yelp mm -hmm. and Health Grades that are now uh, have been, have been available that you can research for uh, for providers. And there's also um, a rating called HCAPS, um, H-C-A-H-P-S, which is essentially a rating based upon other patients' experiences with a healthcare provider. So HCAP scores are also something that you can look at for, um, for finding a provider. And then, of course, I, I would uh, advise anyone to look at the physician training and board certification if you're selecting a physician. When you look at following up with your provider, um, physician portals, digital front doors are really great digital tools for um, kind of asynchronous communication with providers, you know, being able to, to, to communicate when you want to versus trying to, to get somebody on the phone. Um, and then uh, filling and managing prescriptions. Um, I use the CVS app. It's easy for me. I don't have a lot of meds, but I can refill my, uh, my meds pretty easily via that app. It tells me when I'm ready. 
or when it's ready rather. Um, and if uh, and there's other digital tools for more robust management of, of medications. If if uh, if someone needs it, there's a ton of uh, really good uh, apps out there for that. And then in terms of managing uh, your own health, and I think we'll talk more about this in our discussion. Um, there's a lot of health and wellness apps available um, uh, out there. Wearables are great, uh, and there's even online coaches uh, that are readily available for you know personalized care. And then the final step, um, saving and paying for care. You know we now have um, tax advantaged accounts with uh, healthcare savings accounts (HSAs), um, flexible savings accounts (FSAs). Automatic deductions, again, if you're uh, getting your uh, your uh, health care through an employer, are all great ways of saying, uh, saving and paying for care. So really, there's a lot of great resources and tools out there, and they're improving, which is great, and they're becoming more plentiful kind of as we continue this journey um, towards, uh, towards more health care consumerism. Great. So, you know, I do see a lot of uh, these apps myself and use them, so internet playing a big role, and that kind of also... A connected way to understand, you know, how do you think is the healthcare industry leveraging the Internet of Things and connected medical devices to enhance patient care and safety? And what are the potential benefits and implications of this integration? Yeah, um, you know, although the Internet of Things has existed for uh, some time, the, the yeah. pandemic, which I haven't mentioned yet, really accelerated things, right? Um, after the pandemic, you know, patients are even more... Uh, concerned about the health, you know, so uh, they're seeking out new ways to connect with the providers and they're getting more active in their own healthcare decisions. So it's, I think the pandemic is also driving a lot of this healthcare consumerism. According to one survey, um, almost half of patients switched providers during the pandemic. Again, mm -hmm. I think a really profound statistic. So um, the other thing I think the pandemic really drove was the, uh, the use of telehealth, which, you know, has always held great promise but it was accelerated during the pandemic. And I think, you know, uh, again, to go back uh, to McKinsey, um, in their paper that I read, 55% of patients are more satisfied with digital solutions actually than even in-person solutions. And uh, almost 65% of them are, are more interested in them. So, you know, and when we think of telehealth, we think of live video discussions, like what we're having here. So like, if you were my physician, this is what I would think telehealth is, but it's really, it's a lot more than that, right? It's, it's remote monitoring, it's mobile health, yeah. Again, use the term asynchronous, asynchronous health. Um, and there's some super si simple examples of, of, of telehealth. Think about using the camera on your smartphone. You know, uh, you maybe you have, uh, you got a, a, a wound and uh, your doctor wants to see how it's healing. Take a picture of it, send it to him or her. Uh, okay. What if you have a, a, a concerning um, spot on your skin? You know, could you send it to your dermatologist? And now these are these are not uh, diagnosable events, nor are, you know, we have to figure out reimbursement, but it's simple things like this, I think, can really help with the connectivity between, you know, patients and, uh, and providers. So um, I think when we think about, when I think about Internet of Things, um, I, I kind of put it in three really broad buckets, and I'm probably oversimplifying things, but on, on one end, I think about um, regulated connected medical devices. Uh, in the middle, I think about uh, unregulated wearable devices. And on the other end, I think about you know, regulated, but mostly unregulated, you know, patient apps, right? And so maybe um, I'll give an example of, of, of each of those um, to tell you why I think, you know, uh, is, is, you know, progress being made is phenomenal, first of all, and why it's so important. Um, on the connected medical devices, something I've been pretty close to is implantable cardiac devices. So uh, pacemakers and uh, implantable cardiac defibrillators. The pacemakers have been around for you know over 60 years. Uh, the new ones are as big as the, the end of your pinky, go directly into the heart. Um, and they're wonderful. They're truly life-saving devices. They provide life-saving therapy, but they also collect a ton of information. And, and and this is an industry that has has come a long way. You know, in the old days, uh, this information was able to be extracted from the device uh, via at, at home via a, 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 a wand that the patient would put over their chest. They would plug it into into their phone line. The, the little squealing modem would, would would squeal, and the information went across uh, you know the landline to the to the physician. Now, 
the best the 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 standard of care is that these devices get checked between two and four times per year. And so as the industry evolved, you could substitute a remote check for an in-person check. So maybe you come to see your doctor once a year instead of four times a year, and three times a year you send the information over the uh, over the phone line. And that's great. And then, then we got some reimbursement for that. And so it's good for the patient. It's convenient. It's good for um, good for really uh, society because uh, of the efficiency. People don't have to get in their car. And it's great for the physician. As the technology evolved, we put radio frequency antenna into the implantable devices. So now, um, rather than the patient have to be um, actively involved in transmitting, uh, they it's it, it now. Uh, removes a patient from the equation. So there's a bedside monitor. They lay down at night. It says, is there anything to send? Uh, wakes the device up, nothing to send, shuts it back down, something to send, it sends. Um, and that also uh, allowed us to begin to have alerts. So if there was an issue with the device or the patient, um, it would actually send that information in between those two to four times per year intervals to alert the physician that something was going on. So really, really great advancement. Now, fast forward to just five years ago, we put Bluetooth into these devices. So now the device connects directly to the patient's smart device, tablet or phone. And presumably they're like me, they're, the phone is with them 24 seven. Uh, they're being monitored 24 by seven. And so the, um, you know, the patient uh, relief of knowing that they're being monitored 24 seven is high. Um, you know, they uh, can start to interact with some of that information because it, since it's passing through the phone, we can give the patient an app where they can actually see some of that information. So what's my heart rate? Did I get a shock? Um, how long is my battery going to last? When do I need to have a repeat procedure? So, uh, you know, so that progress, I think, is significant, and, and there's a ton of examples. You know, whether it's you know, diabetes, uh, you know, um, insulin pumps, uh, uh, implantable pain monitors that uh, that are making you know similar progress. So really, really great example, I think, of uh, of uh, regulated medical devices. When we look at that second section, the wearables, um, think about what Apple and others are doing. You know, we are now seeing wearables that uh, that measure arrhythmias, like AFib. Uh, heart rate variability, which is an indication of your uh, of your fitness, uh, O2 saturation, respiration. So a lot of the things that that pacemaker only could could tell you now these these wearable devices are providing to it. So I think we're going to see, you know, more and more integration as those wearable devices kind of come uh, to the left and the implantables and the uh, regulated devices. There's a convergence, and you're going to see more and more. Uh, I think of of connected, um, you know, with wearables and and maybe implantables and regulated, and and it'll be interesting to see what big tech does. You know, so far they stayed away from from the regulated devices and and have allowed companies, you know, like Medtronic to to play in that space due to our, you know, our regulated our regulatory and and clinical uh, expertise. But who knows? I mean, maybe they'll cross that line at some point. And then I think the final uh, one I wanted to cover was just patient apps. Uh, this is, I, I guess, this Internet of Things, but it's it's not a connected device, but it's a connected app. And there's too many to name, but I I, I want it. Um, I want you to to think about the and keep an eye on the wellness space. I think you know um, it's it's definitely uh, post pandemic something that patients are thinking a lot about. And I think we're finally going to move uh, a little bit more away from moving to tre from treatment to more prevention of disease, which is which is really, really good. Personalization is another um, uh, is another big topic where uh, uh, we're seeing uh, our ability to meet patients where they are um, based upon their personal needs. So I, I think I'd kind of summarize your question that there's just this um, hyper convergence of technology and medical technology. And we've been waiting for healthcare to be disrupted, and I, I think it's happening. I think it's a good thing. You've got you know, you know, players like United Health and Optum and CVS Health doing some really interesting things, and and big tech is doing some interesting things, and it's really forcing the traditional players in healthcare to to uh, to think differently and disrupt themselves and and you know partner in new ways. Yeah, I think. Um... One thing that's coming in picture, you know, the more and more you're talking about Internet of Things and, you know, data and connectedness is a lot of data here. Mm -hmm. So how, yeah. how do you think 
data analytics or what role does data analytics have in um, healthcare consumerism? How can this be used to help in identifying the trends or maybe improve patient outcomes or even reduce healthcare costs? So how do you think that can be used? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right on. There's a ton of data uh, here. Um, the, the problem is data for data's sake is not all that valuable. So, you know, trying to lend context to the data and having analytics to make the data actionable is really where where the focus is right now. You know, I gave that example of uh, all that data that existed in in uh, the the implantable uh, cardiac devices. So, uh, I think data analytics are you know does and will continue to play a, a huge uh, role in healthcare and and healthcare consumerism. So, and now with with the data we have you know readily available, um, massive computing power that's available. So we can use tools like analytics and algorithms and machine learning and artificial intelligence to, you know, manipulate, you know, huge amounts of data in really very short segments of time. So it's a really exciting time, I think, really in all industries, but particularly in healthcare. So maybe I'll um, I'll give you a few more examples to to bring this home. Uh, let's let's think about that. The, the very simple example, the wearable example that I gave you, my my Whoop band. Um, some of the raw data I get are heart rate, heart rate variability, um, hours of sleep, some of the you know, respiration, some of the things I just talked about, which is all interesting data, but not super actionable, you know, for the average human being. Well, you know, they they took it one step further and they 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 made an algorithm to give me a dashboard in two key areas. One is strain, one is recovery, you know, and strain and, it, and it's a red light, green light, yellow light you know, based upon uh, how hard I worked that day, how much stress I had that day. And then recovery is uh, is what it sounds like. Right. And so th those are those are actionable, um, you know, uh, insights that uh, that that I can take and, 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 and change behavior. Um, another area where I think data is really playing in is in direct to patient marketing. Um, there was a press Ganey national survey that said more than half of patients use the internet to find and select uh, the new primary care provider. Uh, more than twice, uh, they're more than twice as likely to use digital versus a doctor's referral to choose their provider. And the top three digital tools they use to find the provider are search engines, no surprise, insurance websites, and health system sites. Um, and interestingly, um, Nearly half of them use the words near me in their search, yeah. but only 15% used uh, the symptom or condition. So, you know, I think that's fascinating data. And now those types of data is available, just like we have it in other industry. Um, if you search for colonoscopy, perhaps you're going to see an ad for your local gastroenterologist and why you should see them. I'll, I'll give you a, a take it a step further. You know, we have a technology at Medtronic uh, called GI Genius, which is an artificial intelligence technology used during colonoscopy. It's basically a second set of eyes for the clinician, and it has been proven uh, in numerous clinical trials to improve the detection of hard to detect precancerous lesions. It also reduces the number of those uh, precancerous lesions that are missed by a physician. I mean, I think they're they're looking at 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 uh, you know a, a screen all day. They they miss these things sometimes. So AI definitely helps. But you know what? Most patients aren't aware of it. You know, so direct to patient advertising from a provider are going to help you know drive awareness of a technology and drive patients to those centers that are using the technology and are providing higher quality care than those that don't. So uh, that's another area where I think data is really having an impact. Um, and the final area I'll talk about is in, in clinical trials. Uh, the gold standard for, for clinical uh, trials is the randomized control trial, right, where you compare two or more, more patient groups. You know, these trials, again, are it's a gold standard, but they're expensive, they're time consuming, and they're not always easy to recruit patients. So we're now seeing a lot of use of existing patient data as a substitute. Uh, and perhaps we'll even be able to use machine generated data as long as we can prove a correlation to to actual data to improve, you know, kind of our speed to results of a clinical trial and reduce the cost. And, and so this is happening. Um, I'll give you uh, actually a pretty old example that we had going back to the implantable cardiac devices um, uh, that. Uh, those defibrillators, implantable defibrillators uh, terminate 
a fast heartbeat by shocking, by providing a shock. And, you know, shocks are painful, but if it's going to save your life, then a patient, you know, um, will tolerate it. Unfortunately, sometimes shocks are unnecessary. They're, um, they, they may not need to actually occur. And what we, what we found through some data was that if you gave the heart a little bit of time and they were in a lethal arrhythmia, a lot of times it would self-terminate mm. and you wouldn't need to actually give the patient a shock. Well, the way most of these devices were programmed that as soon as it de detected this fast heart rate, the shock would occur right away. Well, we gave the option for physicians to program the device to give it a little bit of time so that if it self-terminated, a shock wouldn't occur and it reduced inappropriate shocks. The problem was most patients or most physicians rather were not programming it that way. Either they didn't know the data, um, they didn't believe the data, or they didn't have time or whatever, but it wasn't getting programmed that way. So we actually took uh, reams of, of information and data to the FDA and um, without a clinical trial, we're able to convince them that we should actually have the device pre-programmed to have this longer interval to allow the um, the, 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 the patient to self-terminate. So it's a really kind of early, easy example of how data can be used to um, in clinical trials. Right, and I think a uh, very well mentioned point about Medtronic doing its bit on creating awareness and you know making people aware about what's available. And, and that really brings me to my um, next question, which is about how can the industry players really continue to encourage healthcare consumerism? And you know they can ensure more patients are involved in their own care decisions. So what's their role to play here? That's an awesome question. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that again, the concepts are simple, uh, but the implementation is complex, right? And, and uh, so think about what patients want. They want uh, easy access to affordable, um, high quality and convenient care. I believe they want uh, meaningful, trusting and accessible relationships with their uh, provider, and they want uh, more holistic support, you know, for their overall awareness, not wellness, not just their the treatment of chronic diseases, but you know how do how do how do we cut across the silos of these specialists and uh, that exists, right? So they really want that kind of continuity and holistic approach to the care. Um, now the good news is you can't find a C-suite executive, I think, in the major healthcare players that doesn't have this on the radar, right? It's a top priority really for any stakeholder executive. Um, but the implementation is, is like I said, kind of complicated. And so, you know, why, why is that? Why is it so difficult? Well, you've got a lot going on uh, right now. You've got, you know, industry dynamics like, you know, record inflation, uh, supply chain disruption, um, workforce shortages in our industry um, and you got tech enabled disruptors which we just talked about so there's a lot a lot going on there it's, there's a it's a rapidly evolving care and a coverage landscape right this it's moving quick and and the pace of innovation you know has accelerated i think it's going to continue to accelerate you know again due to you know healthcare and consumer tech and investment of private equity and, and venture capital and into tech so the train is moving fast, right? And we're trying to change it, uh, you know, um, you know, while it's moving. So I think if I go by stakeholder by stakeholder, what needs to happen? Um, you know, and this is this is, you know, I think really straightforward again in concept, but but difficult to implement. You know, employers need to continue to, you know, offer expanded, uh, easy to understand plan options for their employees. Um they need to make data readily available and they need to help with funding, you know, through employer sponsored uh, funding, HSAs, FSAs, et cetera. So, um, you know, employers need to, to continue to do what they're doing, but, uh, but do it even better. Um, insurance companies need to have expanded plan options, make them readily accessible um, and information available for people to make good decisions. Um, you know, providers need to continue to make it easier for patients to shop for services and interact with their system. So things like um, price transparency tools, which we talked about, um, patient navigation tools, um, online appointment scheduling, which we talked about, digital bill pay and payment options, you know, all those things that are more consumer oriented uh, providers need to focus on. They also need to train their staff, including their physicians, <laughs> to, to treat their patients like customers. 
And when you treat your patients like customers um, and they're acting like consumers, again, that's going to drive, you know, market share is going to drive customer and patient satisfaction and all, all those good things. And I think that all the players in the industry need to look for ways to improve access, whether that's digital um, health and wellness centers, other alternative sites. Again, I mentioned, you know, CVS Health and, and others that are that are creating, you know, uh, new wellness centers. Um, and I think, you know, my industry, the pharma, the device and, and technology company industry, you know, we need to continue to innovate and provide tools that make these interactions um, integrated and seamless for the patient. Um, I can assure you and Medtronic that we're firmly committed to addressing these opportunities. We've got a lot of uh, a lot of activity and initiatives focused on uh, on healthcare consumerism, patient engagement, and and patient satisfaction. So, you know, I think a summary: we've come a long way, and we still have a long way to go. But uh, but I think you know it's very exciting, and I think we're we're on our way to to achieving that triple aim, aim to make sure that we got the best access to the highest quality of care at the lowest possible cost. Great. And, you know, that brings us to the end of this conversation. It was wonderful speaking with you, Drew. It was very engaging. And um, thank you, everybody, for listening in. I was in conversation with Drew Logan, Vice President, Sales and Marketing, Gastrointestinal Medtronic. Thank you, Drew, once again. Thank you so much, Yamini. I enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to know how you can navigate and thrive in this disruptive era, subscribe to Disruption Dialogues on your go-to podcast channels and stay tuned for more interesting episodes.